by a composition law that allows us to translate from one time to the, to the next. And the, uh, this is a Lie group, uh, it's a continuous group, continuous differential group, and we can talk about uh, the elements of the group that are near identity. And a small translation away from the identity is therefore generated by uh, the object that is the conserved quantity, and that is energy. And that's defined by the Hamiltonian operator. And from that, we thus derived the differential equation that is sometimes known as a form of the time dependent Schroeder. Uh, or alternatively, we can look at this as an equation for the time evolution of the state. So for example, if I have a pure state uh, at time t0, then in a system that for which we gain nor lose any information, we know that we have unitary evolution of the system and that unitary time evolution is defined by this equation, we can then write a differential equation for the state evolving uh, according to uh, the Schrodinger equation. All right? And the general solution uh, we can write down. So the solution for the time evolution operator can be written down formally in terms of the exponentiation. And we, if we allow ourselves for this Hamiltonian operator to be explicitly time dependent, if we have some time dependent parameters, uh, like a magnetic field that's changing in time, uh, then the general form we had is actually kind of complicated. But if it is the case that this operator commutes with itself at different times, then we can write down the solution explicitly. Uh, and what we'll typically be dealing with, uh, unless we say otherwise, is the case where the Hamiltonian is independent of time. It's some uh, constant operator. Um, and in which case, the time evolution operator is just the exponentiation of the Hamiltonian times the time propagation. Um, the of particular interest, as you know, are the set of states that are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And the solution to this equation, or this equation itself, is called the Schroeder equation also. It's the time independent Schroeder equation. And it plays, as you know, a central role in quantum theory. In fact, you know, if you're a chemist, this is all you really care about, or a material scientist at the time. You just solving for the energy levels. Um, right. So um, if we have this solution, then we can write down a, a simple representation of the time evolution operator in terms of the energy eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Because we know a function of an operator can always be written in uh, the um, basis of the eigenvectors of that operator, in which case this is a diagonal operator with these eigenvalues, right? And that's a, if we can write that down easily, then we have a nice way of writing down the time propagation, the solution to the uh, initial value problem. So if I'm given the state, at the initial time, let's say t equals zero, then we can find the state at any later time by just propagating it according to the time evolution operator. And if I insert this form of the time evolution operator here, well then I've solved it. Because the solution at some later time is just this superposition with these now amplitudes that are given by this. So if I know what the initial decomposition of the state is in terms of the energy eigenstates, then 
the decomposition in a later time is just I, apply, I put this phase factor on each of the probability amplitudes and resum. Okay? So, uh, something to, of course, note about this is that the probability to be in the energy eigenstate E lambda at a later time, if the system evolves according to this, is what? It's the same. It's the same at, at any time, right? Because this is the square uh, of this, which is this. But that doesn't mean that nothing's happening as a function of time. It would be true if there was just, if the state itself were an energy eigenstate, then there would just be one coefficient, and that uh, would be then the same state at all times, up to an overall phase, which is irrelevant, and that's why they're called stationary states. But if the state is initially, at the initial time, a superposition of energy eigenstates with different energy eigenvalues, then the state will evolve as a function of time because the relative phases between the terms and the superposition are different at different times. And it's the relative phase between uh, basis states that determines what the state is. Right? And we saw this in an example where we looked at Larmor precession. Where we imagine we have some uh, magnetic moment in a magnetic field. And in that case, we wrote down the Hamiltonian minus mu dot b. Take this to be a constant magnetic field. This is the magnetic moment, dipole moment. And the magnetic dipole moment is proportional to, of course, uh, a particle with a total angle momentum that is its spin. It's proportional to the uh, so mu here is proportional to the spin, and that proportionality concept we call the gyromagnetic ratio. And um, this is the Molmore frequency. It's called the Molmore frequency because that's what it in classical uh, dynamics of a spin in a magnetic field, that's what you get. This is the frequency by which a, a magnetic moment will process in a magnetic field. This is an operator. Um, and in that case, we could simply work this up, or we could write this if you like, and I do like, hr over 2 dot sigma. And if this is in the z direction, if we were in, if if B is in the Z direction, and this is the Hamiltonian. And then we could just simply, if, if, if we had a situation where, say, at the initial time, the spin is, say, pointing along the X direction, then according to this, we just wrote down this. That's this, the time evolved state with this Hamiltonian. We plug that in. Uh, and what we found when we did all that was this is cosine of the lower position is three over two, x minus i sine omega t over two spin down along x. And so the probability to be spin up along x as a function of time, what we what this is equal to is cosine squared, the square of this amplitude, which is one minus cos or one plus cos omega over two, and the probability to be spin down along x as a function of time is one minus 
or sine squared omega t over 2, which is 1 minus cos. And so as we plot it as a function of time, what we see is an oscillation And this is an example of what we call coherent <coughs> evolution of the quantum state. It is coherent because we are in, we are maintaining the coherence of a position. It's not like a quantum jump that you learn about your you know sophomore physics, where you say it's in this energy level and then it goes to that energy level, and there's a quantum jump. That's not described simply by the time dependent Schroeder equation, because that's not a reversible evolution. This is completely reversible. It's coherent. Weight is much better to think about things like quantum jumps, which are much more complicated to understand. All right, any questions? All right then, let's continue. So, um, the way that we're des we described uh, the time evolution of the system by how the state evolves as a function of time is known as the Schrodinger equation. In the Schrodinger picture, what we say is that the state evolves as a function of time. Observables are constant operators. But 
that on the most part we're going to ignore for the most part. Because we're not really deal with it. Okay? Now, so there is this kind of asymmetry here. The states evolve. And the operators are constant. Good. Now, in, if we think about what the quantum theory uh, does, what we, what we demand of the quantum theory is that we use quantum theory to predict the outcomes of measurements. That's what it's supposed to do, and at least with some probability. That's what we're doing. So the physical content prediction of minimum outcomes. And those measurement outcomes, for example, we have the Born rule, which, for example, we say the probability of finding a particular, say, eigenvalue of an observable is equal to uh, say for a projected measure. Generally, it could be a POVN element, and this says this could be a density matrix, in which case we'd have a sum over all the, the states in my statistical mixture. But that would be, that's, it's generically not this form. Um, or we might have expectation values, which are sums of this weighted by the eigenvalue. Say the expected value of some observable function of time is equal to this. However, as you notice, the physical content that we are extracting from on here isn't about the state itself, but about matrix elements. The matrix elements that have the physical quantity, quantities, not the states alone. Okay, so the physics depends on the matrix elements. In this case, right? Which means that if this is the thing that I want, or this is the thing that I want. I kind of have a choice of how I'm going to calculate it. Let's write this thing out explicitly. Let's say I look at the expected value of this observable.
A of T. In which case, it's perfectly equivalent to say that that this expectation value as a function of time is equal to whatever the initial state was, but this is this expectation value. It doesn't matter what the word of t is or not. No, I'm just, here I'm just emphasizing this is, I'm looking at the expectation value. It's a, some function of time. So, in this picture, if we wanted, whatever we want to calculate, the state is constant. What's evolving is the operators. And I can do exactly the same thing for probabilities. The probability to find a certain outcome here would be equal to this. But I can equally write it. as this. Where this is this. Okay. Now to keep this notation straight, what we often do is say that there's two pictures. In this picture, we call it the Schrodinger picture. In the Schrodinger picture, my, I, I say the state evolves as a function of time, and this is a constant. And this is, so in order to denote that, we'll put a little label, which often we don't do once we know what picture we're working in. But I'll denote this with that superscript S, which means the Schrodinger picture. Alternatively, in this picture, the state is constant as a function of time. All right? And so this is, this picture is known as the Heisenberg picture. In the Heisenberg picture, we take the, in the Heisenberg picture, the state is constant and it's, given, it's equal to whatever the Schrodinger picture state was at time t equals zero. Okay? And we take it to the same state all times. The state is constant. In contrast, the observables evolve. So I have F. And again, they are taken to agree at times t equals zero. So this operator at times t equals zero is whatever the Schrodinger picture operator was. So that they agree at the initial time and then they propagate forward. Okay? So we have two different ways of doing uh, our time evolution. Uh, when do we use one and when do we use the other? That's the point. Well, it, we could, as we said, they're absolutely formally equivalent. They have some pluses and minuses in terms of when you might consider uh, looking at the Schrodinger picture for time evolution versus looking at the Heisenberg picture for time evolution. to uh, notice is that 
given the state as a, at all times, we can calculate all uh, experiments or I'm going to calculate predict all experiments at time t meaning that if I have the state the total state then I can use this to calculate the probability of any measurement outcome because that probability is given by the appropriate Born rule, right? Whereas in the Heisenberg picture, we must consider the observable evolving for each experiment. So if I want to know the probability of measuring outcome A about observable A, I'd have to find the evolution of this observable. If I want to find the probability of measurement of outcome B associated with observable B, I have to find that differential equation. I have to do each differential equation separately. Okay? Now, that comes at a trade-off because this is typically easier. For a given observable. And this is typically hard. And that kind of makes sense because in some sense this contains all the information about all observables. Whereas this only contains the information about that particular observable. Okay. So if you want the information about all possible measurements you can make out of all possible observables, well then you want to solve the Schrodinger time-dependent Schrodinger equation. But if there's only some particular observables that you care about, then typically you would use the Heisenberg equation in terms for solving the time evolution. Okay. Um, of course, either picture is equivalent if you have the whole time evolution operator. If you have the propagator, if you have the whole thing, which we were able to do first in that particle, well, then you have both pictures, all, right? Because that's just related. But typically, you can't solve that easily. What else can I say about this short picture versus the Heidelberg picture? Um, in this, I would say the connection to classical dynamics is obscure. Meaning, if we have the state is evolving in time, it's kind of hard to connect it to what's going on. If I want to think about this, what's the equivalent classical trajectories that things would do? It's typically obscure. It's not easy to see in the Schrodinger picture. Whereas, as we'll see in the Heisenberg picture, connection is explicit. And finally, the difference I would say is that um, if we want to consider uh, multi-time correlations, are not Suppose I want to know what is the correlation between the spin at one time and the spin at a later time. Well, 
Heidelberg is also on dependence. No, in Heidelberg there's time dependence, and time dependence is in, is in the observables. Okay. Right? The thing is that you could say, you know, so I could look at what I mean by a two time correlation function and say, what is the, I have, say, two spins, and I want to know uh, what is the correlation between uh, the spin at time one and the spin at time two. I can calculate that easily in the short, in the high picture because they're time dependent. Whereas, what would that mean in the short picture? Because there's only there's only one state, and it has one time. So we'll come to that later. All right, so um, if we have the Heisenberg picture, we want to, uh, we, the state is fixed, and we have to find the uh, observable at a later time. Now, if we have the time evolution operator, then we just do this, right? Uh, but generally, we don't have the full time evolution operator. And so, as in the Schrodinger picture, we want to write a differential equation. And typically, we would solve differential equations in the evolution. So what we are going to now write down are the Heisenberg equations of motion. So what is that? So what we said is that the Heisenberg picture operator as a function of time is given by the general is this. So this is how I get from the Schrodinger picture to the Heisenberg picture, where the Heisenberg picture operator at the initial time is the Schrodinger picture operator. What is the differential equation that this thing satisfies? This is equal to take the derivative of that plus. Schrodinger, you 
t minus i over h bar h u dagger h in the Schrodinger picture u t. Right? And this is a Heisenberg picture. And so is this. Uh, what did I do wrong? I did something wrong. Oh. This is on this side. Zero. Absolutely. But it doesn't necessarily. It's a commutator, indeed. So what we find is that the Heisenberg equation of motion says that the time derivative of some observable in the Heisenberg picture is given by I over h bar plus I over h bar, the Hamiltonian commuting with this. Now, I want to make one small point, which uh, is a subtle, very subtle point. You come back over here, written in a very small type here. It's something that looks like that equation, but it's not that equation. It's not in one important way. It's got this minus sign. This is a Schrodinger picture evolution. Because even though it's the operator, it's the state. The state is evolving. Okay? Because in this, when I have a general mixed state, the state is an operator. Okay? That's a, the that's a Schrodinger equation. That's not the Heisenberg picture. This is the Heisenberg picture. And in this case, rho is constant. So in the Heisenberg picture, the state is constant. Me. So in the Schrodinger picture, the state evolves. The operators are constant. In the Heisenberg picture, the operators evolve, and the state is constant. The psi is constant. All right. Now, one should note that this looks, in classical mechanics, We're going to talk about this in more detail in the coming lectures. Let's say I have a Hamiltonian H, which is a function of position momentum. some observable physical quantity which is some itself some function of position momentum. It might be position, it might be momentum, it might be angular momentum. Okay? It's some observable, right? And I want to know, how does this evolve as a function of time? Do you know how to get that? If I have the Hamiltonian, have you done that in classical mechanics? There's something called Hamilton's equations of motion, right? 
So Hamilton's equations of motion, that's why it's called Hamiltonian. have a, a general form. And that form could be written explicitly as this. Where this is known as the Poisson bracket. And it's equal to the partial of the first thing with respect to x times the partial of the second thing with respect to p in the other way around. Okay. Those are the Hamilton's equation of motion in a, in, a, in a very generic form that you may not have seen if you didn't get to this point in classical mechanics. These are Hamilton's equations of motion. Now, there is something that looks pretty darn similar between the classical Hamilton's equations and the quantum Heisenberg equations. We will see in the way in which, in some sense, this is some appropriate limit of this. But we see this parallel. And Dirac notices first and said, oh yeah, we quantize there's some way in which the Poisson bracket becomes the commutator. But this looks very similar to the classical dynamics. Right. Okay. Um, change of this with respect to time? Uh, well, the partial of h with respect to p is p over m, and the partial of h with respect to x is 1. That's the velocity. Right? And the rate of change of momentum with respect to time is 0, because momentum is conserved. Generally, this would be the h x, which is the gradient of potential, and there's no potential.
So let's formally integrate this. So if I just look at the integral of that, that says that the Heisenberg operator at time t is given by, well, there's an initial condition. And then plus i over h bar, the integral from 0 to t of that. That's just writing down the integral. I didn't really solve anything here because I have the time dependent operator on this side of the equation and on that. So not really a solution yet, but I can iterate now. Now I can plug in this solution again, and I get so I'm going to get a formal series here. Mm -hmm. So what I did here is I integrated once, wrote down the formal solution, and now I plugged in for this of t prime. And this of t prime is equal to this times the integral from 0 to t prime times the integral over t double prime. Yeah? Wasn't it integral from 0 to t for both of the integrals? Because I'm plugging in here t double prime. Right? So let me see. So what I what I plugged in here, I said this at time t prime, I plugged in for that, is equal to this at time zero plus the integral to t prime, because that's the variable, and then integrate t double prime. Minus i over h bar, h. Heisenberg picture operator, t double prime. So I just plug that in. I mean, this is just changing this to t prime. Is that clear now? Yeah. Good. So this is what's called a Dyson. Yeah. So just real quick, is that on the second term, is that first dt, is that a dt prime, or is that just a? Yes, that's a dt prime. Thank you, Steve. Yep. Now this would be a way of getting a power series solution for short t, but we can look at it as a general power series solution. Let's actually independent of uh, t, right? So this is equal to t times that commutator. And I'll just write it out. Right? That's what that equals. Because this is independent of time. Okay? And then I have this term. Well, this I can't do anything, but I can plug this one in again. It'll be an a0 
a at time t equals zero, which is the, the uh, initial a, the Schrodinger picture a, plus a commutator of a commutator with a commutator, right? So this guy, when you do that out, it's going to be equal to one half t squared if you do that integral because you get t and then the integral from zero to t is one half t squared times the commutator of h and h and a plus order t cubed terms. So, what we have thus is a way of expressing the solution as a Dyson power series. <coughs> Which says that the, in the Heisenberg picture, solution at time t, which is equal to this, is given by the sum over powers, 1 over n factorial, minus i over, or plus i over h bar, to the power n. commutator of a with h zero n times, where this is a shorthand for h commuting with h commuting with n times. Okay. And this is often a useful thing to use. Or, I wouldn't say often. I'd say once in a while. This is really a result from Lee group theory. Let me explain where I am. H bar 
Well, this result is this, where now B is equal to I times the Hamiltonian times time over H bar. And you plug that in, and you get that. Right. Okay. Um, I should say there's a related result that I want to just note here. Suppose I have two Lie group elements. Uh, e to the A and E to the B. And I want to combine them together. Okay. There's a composition law. Now, this generally does not equal this. if A and B don't commute. If they do commute, then you can do that. But if they don't commute, you can't do that. However, what is true is that uh, E to the A times E to the B equals E to the A plus E to the B plus uh, a half, they want that to come together, yeah. it's a half. Half times the commutator of A and the half of B plus higher order terms. Okay? And if <coughs> the commutator will use this a lot when we talk about the harmonic oscillator. If the commutator of this with either A or B is zero, so if, the, if this thing is some operator that commutes with both of these guys, well then you can uh, factor it out. And then what we have is that E to the A plus B is equal to E to the A times e to the b times e to the minus a half the commutator of a and b, if this is true. This is a form of what's known as baker campbell Hausdorff. It's a pH. Same. Right? 
car, right? So now I want to find the equations of motion. Let's just, yeah, just to emphasize this. This operator, everything in the Heisenberg picture, so I'm not going to write little H's everywhere. We're in the Heisenberg picture. Is equal to I over H bar, the commutator of the Hamiltonian with SD. And what is that? Plug it in. Zero. This is SC. SC can be with itself. Right? And that's as we expect. So SZ as a function of time is SZ at zero, which is the Schrodinger picture SZ. This is H bar over two. 1 minus 1, 0 in the basis plus z minus right? It's constant. And that's, as we expect, the z component of the spin is a constant of the motion because it commutes with the Hamiltonian. Okay? What about the other components? Let's look at the x component of the spin. According to Heisenberg equation of motion, this is equal to that. Right? Plug it in. Minus i times the long more frequency over h bar the commutator SZ with SX, right? Which is what? So there's a, it's an I times SY, is it plus or minus? How do we know? Because it's a cyclic permutation, right? So this is I times uh, SY. So this is equal to, or h bar, right? Right. Didn't take away my h bars. That's what it is. So this is equal to omega s y, right? And similarly. The solution is that the solution 
solution to this equation is, well, there is an initial condition we need for both the first, the, what it was at time two zero and its derivative. This one is sigma y. 
So sigma x at this later time became what? Sigma O or sigma y. This is what's confusing about the Heisenberg equation. The matrix is not constant with the function of time. But you have to just, and that's exactly what you see, right? When omega t is pi over 2, code sine of pi over 2 is 0. And sine of pi over 2 is 1. Sigma x at time t becomes sigma 1. And vice versa. All right, so with that said, at the end of the day, this is used to calculate things. For example, if I wanted to know what is the mean value of the spin along, say, the x, y, and z directions as a function of time, what is it? Well, this is what it is at time equal to zero. That's constant, because that's irrelevant. And this is equal to whatever the initial value was. All right, very good. So, 
Um, it's very hard for your exam.